Hi, my name is Tom Doherty, and I teach philosophy at the University of Cambridge. In our last video, we explored the role of consent in our moral lives, and we looked at the relationship between consent and rights. In this video, I'm going to talk about the nature of consent. I'm going to talk about what we have to do to give our consent to people. Moral philosophers are interested in what makes actions right or wrong. One topic that moral philosophers are interested in is consent. For instance, we know that as a default, it's usually wrong for other people to touch our bodies or property. They would infringe our rights. But by giving our free and informed consent, we can waive our rights and make it morally okay for them to do so. Suppose you're on a plane. The person next to you isn't allowed to just take your pen. But if she asks to borrow it, to fill in the immigration form and you give your consent, then she is now permitted to use it. But how does consent work? What would you need to do in order to make it okay for her to take the pen? If we're interested in what consent is from a legal point of view, then we just need to look up what the law is in our society. But if we're interested in what consent is from a moral point of view, then we need to answer this question by doing philosophy. So what is consent from a moral point of view? Some people think that you need to indicate that the passenger is allowed to borrow your pen. That's the behavioural view of consent. Other people say that you don't need to indicate your consent. Instead, you only need to decide that it's okay for the passenger to use your pen. That's the mental view of consent. We can indicate that we're consenting in lots of ways. We can communicate using words by saying, sure, you can borrow the pen. But we also communicate through body language, facial expressions and gestures. If you hold out the pen and smile at the person on the plane, then this could communicate that you are allowing her to use it. So long as it's clear what you mean, then it doesn't seem to matter how you communicate your consent. The behavioural view can agree with the mental view that you need to make a decision to give your consent. If it weren't necessary for you to make any decision, then it'd be possible for you to give consent by accident, for instance, by a slip of the tongue. But even if the behavioural view agrees that a decision is needed, it continues to disagree with the mental view, which claims that a mental decision is enough by itself for consent. This means that the mental view and the behavioural view imply different things about cases where someone makes a decision to consent but does not communicate this decision. Suppose your neighbour puts a note through your door asking to park a moving van in your driveway. You think, sure, that's fine, but you forget to reply. Even though your neighbour hasn't heard from you, she assumes that you don't mind and parks the van in your driveway. Has she acted permissibly? According to the behavioural view, your neighbour did not have your permission. You hadn't indicated that you consent, and so your neighbour wasn't properly authorised to use your driveway. But according to the mental view, she has acted permissibly. After all, you didn't mind her using the drive, and the mental view says that you've consented to someone's behaviour if you don't mind their behaviour. According to the mental view, you could blame your neighbour for parking the van if she didn't have good enough evidence that you don't mind. But since you didn't in fact mind, the mental view implies that your neighbour did have your permission after all. Since the behavioural view and the mental view analyse this sort of case differently, we might try to decide which view to accept by thinking about the case. Do you think the neighbour acted permissibly? If you do, then you should accept the mental view. If you don't, then you should accept the behavioural view. But some people are not sure what to think about these cases. And lots of people disagree about them. So it doesn't seem like we will resolve the debate between the mental view and the behavioural view just by thinking about these cases. What other reasons are there for accepting the mental view or the behavioural view? Some people say we should accept the mental view because they think that consent is an important way that we control our lives. 
since we have complete control over which decisions we make. The mental view would imply that you always have complete control over what you permit people to do. You get to control whether it's okay for your neighbour to use the drive just by deciding one way or the other. No further action is required. But other people say that a mental decision is too private to count as consent. They say that consent needs to be public to transform our moral relationships with other people. They think that consent is a bit like promises, agreements or orders. If someone only made a promise or agreement in their mind, then it would be too private to bind them. And if a sergeant only decides to give an order, but doesn't communicate this order to the troops, then that isn't a proper order either. Fans of the behavioural view think the same is true of consent. They think that consent involves authorising another person's behaviour in a public way, and this requires behaviour indicating the authorisation. While fans of the mental view disagree with the claim that consent needs to be publicly expressed, they can still agree that in practice it's a good idea for your neighbour to park her van only if you have communicated your consent. If she's just assuming that she has your consent, without checking with you that it's okay, then she's taking a risk. And it's irresponsible to take risks. So you could blame your neighbour for taking this risk. So while philosophers disagree about whether consent requires communication, they can agree that to be responsible, you should make sure that you've got another person's consent. In practice, that usually means that this person has to communicate her consent to you. Otherwise, you'd be irresponsible by going ahead. So we can all agree that it's a good idea for us to communicate, while disagreeing about whether communication is necessary for consent. What do you think? Do you need to communicate that you don't mind someone performing an action in order to consent to this action? Or is it enough that you've decided that you don't mind this person behaving in that way? Thanks for watching. To subscribe to Wireless Philosophy on YouTube, click here.